My name is Sitara and I'm a postdoc from Radhika Subramanian's lab. Today I'll present a story on how the microtubule is a responsive medium that allows molecular motors to talk to each other over very long distances. So this work is done in collaboration with Professor Meredith Betterton and graduate student Shane Fiorenza from the University of Colorado Boulder. This was a very close collaboration with Meredith and Shane and all the computational and modeling work are done by them. So in the cell, the efficient delivery of goods to specific regions is important to maintain cellular organization. While cities use roads or railways for delivering goods, cells use a cytoskeleton for this purpose. The cytoskeleton is a highly dynamic network of filaments that links all regions and components of the cells. In cities, when roads are crowded, vehicles can communicate with each other and they can influence each other. This can also happen in cellular highways. Interestingly, motor proteins that travel on microtubule filaments are prone to becoming stuck in traffic and can also influence each other. So most of us don't like to be stuck in traffic, but in the context of a cell, sometimes these traffic jams may not be bad. In fact, traffic jams at the ends of the microtubules, which are driven by short range coupling interactions are important for the regulation of microtubule dynamics, such as the growing and shrinking of a microtubule. An example of a motor protein that regulates the microtubule end is Kephore. We decided to use this system to study the coupling of motor proteins. And this is a mitotic spindle protein. It walks to the ends of the microtubules and accumulates at the ends, which we will call end tags as shown in the schematic. Also, these are fluorescence images showing KIF4A labeled in green, forming an end tag on a microtubule labeled in red. So when I first joined Radhika's lab, I was studying KIF4A and this older data from Radhika's paper was something puzzling that caught our attention. So this data is shown in the plot on the right, and it shows that there's an increase in end tag length with microtubule length. So let's think about this. How can we get microtubule length dependent data? In previous literature, the antenna model has been described to get microtubule length dependent accumulation. So in this model, the longer the microtubule, the more motors binding to it and walking to the ends, which would cause a longer end tag and thus microtubule length dependency. However, this is true for a motor with high processivity. The idea is that when a motor has high processivity, it'll bind and walk to the microtubule ends without falling off. The problem with Q4A is that it has a moderate processivity of one micron and only molecules that land near the end can walk to the ends and accumulate. So there's a conundrum here. How can this motor with one micron processivity distinguish a microtubule that is one and 12 microns in length? So how does KIF4A do that? This didn't make any sense to me. To investigate this further, we wanted to reconstitute the activity of KIF4A on single microtubules. For our experiments, we used a turf microscopy assay where first microtubules were stuck on a glass cover slip, labeled KIF4A with GFP was added to the flow chamber and imaged. On the right side are fluorescence micrographs from turf assays showing end tag formation with KIF4A labeled in green on single microtubules labeled in red. So here are five images of microtubules of the same length with different motor concentrations. And this plot shows that the end tag length depend on microtubule length and motor concentration as shown in different shades of green here. So again, how does this motor with a one micron run length form length dependent end tags? This was very puzzling to us. To unravel this mystery, our collaborators Meredith and Shane developed a mathematical model that is based on the Kinesin one stepping cycle. It includes motor binding, unbinding from microtubules, stepping via a mechanochemical cycle driven by ATP hydrolysis, and steric effects. However, in these simulations, end tags don't form as in experiments. 
the lack of intact formation in this model suggests that it is missing a mechanism. What could that be? We were extremely confounded. So this model using the Kinesin-1 mechanochemical cycle doesn't give rise to NTAGs. And the next mechanism we thought could be possible were short range interactions between motors. Therefore, Shane implemented nearest neighbor attractive interactions between motors. And previous studies have shown that clusters of Kinesin-1 were observed due to short range interactions of around 1.6 kT. So he started with this number. So here's a plot of the NTAG length versus microtubule length, and the red shows the experimental data, and the blue shows the simulation data. And the simulations show that the short range cooperativity between Q4A motors is not enough for NTAG formation. And when we change the interaction strength to 10 kT, we can reproduce this effect for short microtubules, but not long microtubules. So this suggests another unknown mechanism which might change Kip4A behavior in ensembles. So far, the model using the Kinesin-1 mechanochemical cycle or short range interactions don't recapitulate the data. What if there's a change in the Kinesin movement as a function of Kinesin density? To get at this, we wanted to look at properties of single motors. So our attempts at recapitulating the data at high crowded conditions aren't working well, and we need to think about it differently. So this paper really caught our eye. Here, what we are seeing are single Kinesin coated beads Every yellow dot is a pre-existing kinesin bead, and every red dot is a kinesin bead that binds. And this data show that the binding of kinesin-1 molecules promotes another kinesin-1 binding, suggesting that in addition to short-range interactions, there could be long-range interactions here. So we wanted to test if this is a case in our system and if this could explain NTAGs. Basically, the idea is that when we are thinking of a highway, which has little traffic and no traffic jams, vehicles are still communicating with each other. Could this be true for our system? Could motors communicate with each other in a dilute binding limit? Just as a reminder, this is the phenomenon that happens at high density, as I've shown previously. K4A accumulates at the plus ends of microtubules forming NTAGs. The NTAG length increases with microtubule length and motor concentration, but how about in the low density condition? To do this, we drop the motor concentration and go to the picomolar range. So we did experiments with low k concentration in the picomolar range where direct protein-protein interactions are unlikely and for our single molecule experiments, we used a turf microscopy assay, as I've shown earlier, where first microtubules were immobilized on a glass cover slip, labeled Kifore and unlabeled Kifore in picomolar concentration were added to the flow chamber and we started taking a movie. So shown here is a snapshot of the earliest time point from the movie from this kind of single molecule experiment. And as I play the movie, we see single molecules appearing on the microtubule and also moving from left to right. From the movie, we can get a record of the spatial position of the mole single molecules on the microtubules over time as shown in this chymograph. And the chymograph is the data with 20 picomolar K4A GFP with no additional K4A protein. And this data showed the movement of single K4A molecules before dissociation. And this is what we expected with K4A as it has a moderate processivity of one microns. However, what was surprising to us was the addition of small amounts of additional unlabeled K4A led to longer unidirectional movements of individual K4A molecules. So just to clarify here, 
in these experiments, only the 20 picomolar kephore is labeled and we're adding increasing amounts of dark molecules. In that way, we can look at how motors respond to each other on the same microtubule. So what's interesting here is that even at sub nanomolar protein concentration, where short range kephore kephore interactions are not likely, the processivity of the motor is sensitive to protein density. And from this data, that's the first thing we noticed. We saw that the kephore processivity or run length varies with density at this picomolar concentration. We then use mathematical models to ask what mechanisms might explain the surprising result. So here's a plot of the run length as a function of kephore concentration uh, from experiments and modeling. And as expected, short range cooperativity here in blue is not enough to reproduce the low density data of run length in yellow. Therefore, we considered the possibility of long range interactions between motors. Meredith and Shane modeled long range binding interactions by adding an attractive quadratic potential between motors with a range of several microns and they found that long-range cooperativity predicts the changes in run length at low density, qualitatively similar to experiments. And when we saw these results, we were excited because here's a plausible explanation for our unexpected data. Now, if we go back to the chymographs I've shown you earlier with the single molecule Kip4A, in addition to the changes in run length, we also found that the velocity changes as well. If we use the same model of long range binding to explain the velocity, it doesn't agree well with the experimental data. And this tells us that in addition to long range interactions, there must be something else that contributes to Kifure behavior. So the binding effects alone are not enough. And this got us thinking. So Meredith and Shane refined the model and added a parameter to alter the motor stepping behavior of Kifore. And with this addition, we can now recapitulate the velocity data as well. So again, long range interaction between motors that affects both binding kinetics and motor stepping explains our experimental data well. So how can this be possible? We think that the long range coupling between Q4A molecules is mediated by changes to the microtubule lattice. So if this were the case, then it would also occur with other kinesins besides Q4A. Also, another concern we had was, could what we're observing in the low density conditions be due to oligomerization? This might be a possibility because Kifore has a long tail and tail interactions could cause oligomerization. To rule this out, we use a minimal kinesin one called K401 with a truncated tail. And because it has no coil coil tail, it is unlikely to oligomerize. Again, with K401, we measured the motility of single Q4A GFP molecules in the presence of an increasing concentration of unlabeled K401. And when the total motor concentration was increased by adding unlabeled K401, single Q4A GFP molecules moved more processively and exhibited long unidirectional runs. So what we learned from this experiment is that Q4A changes the motility in the presence of a different kinesin motor, K401. And the effects that we are observing doesn't have to be from the same motor, but it can be induced by another motor. And because the K401 doesn't have a long coil coil tail, we think that it is not due to oligomerization. So what we are observing is that the change in motility of these motors may be due to long range coupling. 
What all the single molecule data suggests is that long distance binding and stepping can explain the behavior of single motors in a dilute binding limit. But can it explain intact formation? Here's a reminder, this is the experimental data. And now we take all the parameters from this model and apply it to high density conditions and NTAGs emerge. So this was exciting to us. Here we are not fitting parameters, but we are simply increasing the motor concentration to the model on the previous slide and also shown here. And from the model, the NTAG length increases with microtubule length and motor concentration as in experiments. Therefore, this model reproduces our experimental data, both at low and high density motor concentration, and says that the single molecule properties, such as processivity and emergent behavior of motor ensembles, such as NTAG formation, require long range coupling mechanism. This model also predicts that near and in the NTAG, the lifetime of K4A increases and its speed drops. To examine whether these changes occur in NTAGs, we did spiking experiments where we added small amounts of K4A GFP and a high amount of K4A clip to immobilize microtubules and we started imaging immediately to visualize NTAC formation in real time. So here's a chymograph from the spiking experiment. This is the KIF4A GFP channel. This is the KIF4A clip channel. And this is the overlay. The chymographs show that the NTAGs form at the plus ends of the microtubules and grow towards the other end until a steady state is reached. And outside the NTAG, the, the motors move processively with long directed runs and moves fast towards the NTAG. And once it enters the NTAG, the molecules slow down. And this data are consistent with the model predictions that NTAC formation occurs through an increase in KIF4A processivity at high concentration, along with a reduction in velocity. So in summary, we describe long range interactions where motors can sense and respond to each other when they're far away. When might this be useful? So long distance interactions may allow motors to self-organize without short range coupling, oligomerization or binding partners. And this kind of coupling can make motors more adaptable, allowing them to perform different functions depending on the surrounding environment and local motor concentration in cells. So, in general, when we think of highways, we think of static mediums. However, I've shown that the microtubule may not be a static, but it's a responsive medium on which motors mark the track, similar to walking on a wooden bridge where the movement from one person can influence others on that same bridge. So one of the challenges in the cellulocytoskeleton is that cargo has to be sent to the correct place. And for this to happen, subsets of microtubules have to be specially marked. This raises the question how microtubules are marked and mechanisms for how they can be altered have been shown with post-translational modifications which change the tracks of microtubules in the cell. However, this work shows that there is a completely different way to mark the tracks so that different motors go to specific subsets of microtubules. And what we are showing here is that the stepping of a motor on a microtubule can affect the concentration of motors. So more motors can be shuttled onto the same track. So long range coupling can make motors more adaptable allowing them to respond to the surrounding environment, local motor concentration in cells, 
and therefore pr promote the emergent behavior such as clustering of motors in the ends, such as NTAC formation for controlling microtubule dynamics. And with that, I would like to thank my postdoc mentor, Radhika, and my lab mates and our collaborators on this project, Meredith and Shane. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a nice presentation. We have, we have a few questions. So the first one is from, oops, sorry, that was your alarm. Um, so what could be the mechanism for long range interactions between kinesins? Could it be mechanical? It's a question from Kinjal Daspiswas. So we are not sure what the exact molecular mechanism of long range interaction is, but we want to figure it out. So previous studies show that uh, kinesin changes the uh, lattice of a microtubule by expanding it so that kinesins have a high affinity to them. So this is an interesting possibility. And um, yeah, we, we just need to do more experiments to really um, look into the mechanism. So we have plenty of time. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, could you please Unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Hi, may I ask a question? Uh, really nice talk, very interesting. I'm wondering the uh, recruitment uh, of these additional motors or the enhanced coupling, is it bi-directional? You know, like can they equally well recruit something ahead of the motor as behind? Or is it only regions of the microtubule where they've already walked, where there's an enhanced coupling? So that's a very interesting question. Uh, we don't know how and where the, micro, uh, the motors are recruited within the uh, microtubule lattice, but it is something interesting to look at. Um, I don't know if uh, in simulations um, this was, um, looked at. Um, I don't know if Shane is here to provide insight. Oh, sorry. I was muted. Can you hear me? Um, okay. So yeah, I can comment on that a little. So in the simulation, it's completely symmetric. But actually, in those Kinesin 1 experiments, they find that the effect is actually, I believe, stronger in front of the motors. That is to say, like, they recruit towards the plus end um, more strongly as they're walking. But in our model, it's just a symmetric Gaussian, so it's equal um, forward and behind. Interesting. So there's a question from Wiley. So in both the model and experiment, can the motors pile up on top of the next to each other or are they in a single file line? So in simulations, we think that uh, the motors are just single molecules and they don't oligomerize. But uh, towards the uh, end of the microtubule, they, um, they pile up and they form like a crowded region. When they form a crowded region, can like do they go next to each other, or um, or are they like on like lined up along the microtubule lattice? So in simulations, um, I th I think they are lined up next to each other because we are modeling a one D protofilament, and not so microtubule has thirteen protofilaments. But for simplicity, we're just modeling a one D. Um, Protofilament. And and in real life, when they run into each other, can they, like so are they on protofilaments that are next to them? Like they're all okay. Right, right. Got it. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question to the what I asked about long-range interactions? Um, so um, 
yeah that's that's a very cool idea that the motors can like locally stretch the microtubule and that can influence the binding of motors elsewhere um so presumably this will depend on the mechanical properties of the microtubule like how stretchable it is so could one of the experimental strategies to verify this be to look at microtubules with different stiffnesses or with like, like and another interesting idea is that here is that there are defects like dislocations in microtubules which influence their stiffness but i don't know if, if is there a way to experimentally kind of create such defects in the microtubules so that's an interesting question um so previous studies by uh, manual theories group do show that kinesins form defects on the microtubule lattice but we haven't tested this experimentally um i guess experimentally we could like test microtubules with um like different lattices um, and um, different protofilament numbers to um, explore this long range mechanism. So I kind of, I had a similar question to Kindle's, which you sort of answered, but I was wondering if, um, if you have the, uh, in, do you know about the distribution of the protofilament number in your like microtubule conditions? Because I think experimentally you can, um, you know, have a, a access a variety of different uh, protofilament number. Do you expect that you're in like the 13 yeah. protofilament number exactly? Are these uh, like, what, are these microtubules are stabilized in uh, with are they like GMP CPP microtubules or are they taxol stabilized? Or so that so influences the mechan I mean, that could influence the mechanical properties of the microtubules. Have you um, explored that? So um, the data I showed you are from taxol stabilized microtubules. And we have briefly done these experiments on dynamic microtubules. And we basically see the same findings but we haven't explored other uh, lattices such as GMPCPP or, um, yeah. But that's something that we would like to find out. 